Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Faru Network News Review today, Monday, 30th July 2018. My name is Omar Wale. I'm here, here with the, the Momodo Kande. Kande. Uh, excuse me, Demba Kande, a lecturer at the University of the Gambia School of Journalism and Digital Media. We'll be discussing the allegations or the remark or the claim made by President Adam Abaro that some journalists requested money from him in return of writing good stories about him. But before that, I will start with the Standard newspaper. Uh, the Standard is reporting that uh, the former Inspector General of the Gambia Police Force, um, Landing Kinte, has told the commission set up to look into the Faraba incident. All the five Faraba PIU officers fired live bullets. You may remember there was a confrontation between the villagers and the paramilitary and uh, three people were shot and killed. Several people were wounded, including 16 police officers and civilians. We also know that uh, a caterpillar was set on fire. Trucks and the police post was also vandalized and several other compounds. VP Dabo says social media destroying the Gambia. That is Usenu Dabo, the leader of the United Democratic Party, who is also the vice president, has said that this, uh, the social media uh, media destroying the countries. Uh, Davo was speaking during the President Barrow's dialogue with the people to in Banjul, and he said social media has been used into good effect during the struggle against Jami. But today it is destroying the country. Um, critics might say, well, well if how, how is that possible? And uh, firefighters also challenged the appointment of the new PRO. The former the PRO then was removed, and uh, a new PR was appointed, but someone worked on the standard newspaper saying that they are against the appointment of the new public relations officer. They said his appointment is meant to, to cover up the irregularities going on at the place. Wasajane wants Jame to be tried. He was a strong, a vocal critic of the, of the former president he, in the 90s, and he was arrested and tortured, and he said he will not forgive Jame unless and until Jame faces justice. That's the time he will consider forgiving the former president, Chame. Asombi Bojang remained to be flown back to the Gambia. He, she died in Equatorial Guinea, where she lives with her son, former president, and a few other people there. And the uh, um, civilian at Hamza Barracks ordered to vacate. Um, civilians living at the Hamza Barracks have been asked to leave the place. You may remember the, the chief of defense staff of the Gambia Armed Forces issued a press uh, notice and asking civilian population living at the Hamza Barak should leave with immediate effect, saying that the, the place is a military installation. It's not meant for civilians to be living at the Hamza Barak. And um, that's all I have in the standard newspaper. The point is saying that Baro government should declare agreement with um, ex-president Jame, that is the deputy spokesperson of the a a APRC Dudu Ja, in an interview with this point newspaper, said they should honor the 14 point sheet paper agreement with President, with, with Barog coalition government on the United Nations and the African Union. According to him, they had an agreement with the former president before he left the country. And Barrow announced 200,000, 20,000 new fisheries jobs. As President Barrow made this announcement during his. Uh, uh, has said that the fisheries plan will be built in two leading fishing towns in Tanya Brufut, both in Combo South, and the Gambia Armed Forces personnel deny mission over hypertension. The point is reporting that the, the public relations officer of the National Hypertension Association has disclosed that some personnel of the Gambia Armed Forces have been denied to go for a peacekeeping mission in the South Sudan as a result or because they have hypertension. You will get the version of the spokesperson of the Gambia Armed Forces. And they're also reporting that murder of the Gambia's exiled president, the murder of Gambia's exiled ex-president died. Point also is reporting similar story. And um, the foray is saying President Barrow warns protesters. You may remember he had a meeting in, in Brickham and where he was saying that uh, now people should respect the law. and. Uh, the former IGP also, Kinte, also appeared before the commission. He also testified. They are also reporting that the death of former, the murder of the former president, Chame. And uh, the voice reporting Dabo denounced Baro Youth Movement. That is the Ali K. Dabo is the councillor for Brikama North constituency, has denounced Baro Youth Movement for national development, saying it is not 
for the be it is not for the best interest of the Gambia. There has been a lot of can say a debate as why the need for Baro youth movement and the Baro Jamia they also reporting that Jamians mother die in Equatorial Guinea. So I that's all we have for you on the papers. I have the the Makande is a lecturer at the University of the Gambia and I also have um, Segu Jame, he's a correspondent for Radio France International and the, the Guardian newspaper is also the Secretary General of the Gambia Press Union. You know, he also joined me now in the studio. So I will start with Mr. Kande. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you had President Barrow claim that uh, some journalists requested money from him. As a, a journalist and a, a journalism lecturer at the University of the Gambia, what do you make of these allegations? I think it's a, it's a very unfortunate development as far as the Gambian media is concerned. Um, a lot of people will tell you that uh, the coming of President Adama Barrow to power signaled a sort of um, a departure from the norm in the Gambian media in terms of freedom of expression and media freedom. And even overall, the perception of the public uh, as far as journalists and journalism is concerned. But the comments by President Adama Barrow sort of, you know, you know puts a lot of uh, cast of shadows of doubt over the work of journalists and, you know, sort of, in a way, has the potential to, you know, give a negative uh, public opinion as far as journalism and the work of journalists is concerned. And that is very concerning, given that the role of the media is to hold public officials, the likes of President Adama Barrow and his cabinet and other government officials to account. That's a, that's a constitutional responsibility. So sort of what President Adam Barrow is doing will uh, jeopardize the work of journalists and journalism in this country. And that, to the extent that it will jeopardize it, is rather unfortunate for the President. Thank you, Mr. Kande. I will turn to Sekou Jame. Sekou, welcome. Well, thank you. Um, you, I will not ask you whether you had it or so because you already had an interview with the Standard newspaper and you said, and I even quote this on BBC, that if journalists actually have gone to Barrow and asked for money, that is unethical and there is nothing wrong for Barrow to disclose that. What do you make of Barrow's allegations? Well, um, it, is, it is quite a concern. Me as a practicing journalist and also as, um, um, I mean, as a GPU person, um, because um, like Dilma, Dilma, my colleague here, pointed out, um, when, when you make comments, comments like this, it risks um, people attacking journalists. So that's the risk there, and it's not expected from the president. Of course, the president has every right to say what he did. If journalists went to him to ask for money, I mean, he has a right to say that actually journalists came to ask for money from me. Um, but then as a president, what he should put above everything else is the need to protect the institutions of democratic governance. And one such crucial institution is the media. How do you portray the media I mean, is very important. And I have not seen any president done that I mean, in, in the whole world where a president will come out and say, journalists actually ask money from me. So this is the first time we're hearing this. Uh, for the first time. The first time. Yes. Even though Jami has been criticized, has been yes. antagonist to the media, his media human rights record, including his approach towards the journalists, but Jami never come publicly to say journalists uh, requested money from me. As far as you know, Seiko, mm -hmm. what do you know about this whole thing? Is there any journalist you know who's involved in this thing or so? Because this has put the whole the journalism profession in a very, very funny situation. I strongly want to believe that the president confused public relations work with that of journalism. I mean, journalists do this, or peer persons do this across the world, where you as a government, or as an institution, or as an individual, they may see that there is a need for you to, um, you know, polish your image a bit. They can come and say, we have this project for you. We want you to sponsor it so that we can I mean, project you in a very positive light. But then journalism ethics do not encourage that. But then essentially, what the ethics is telling us is that whenever you do such a thing, you have to come out and tell the public that this particular journalistic work that I have done is paid for. New African did it here with Jame, and they, do it, they did it with a lot of heads of state across. They do special report for you. Journalists do that, but then 
I want to believe that the president confused that with uh, PR work. And then um, I am not saying that a government journalist wouldn't do what Barrow said they have done. But I am a journalist, and I've been here practicing for a while. I know that the kind of journalists that I know and interact with wouldn't go down that line. We've been here for more than 22 years on the journey, beaten and battered, denied even our economic rights, and no journalist went to Germany to ask for payment to be able to project him in a positive light. And I want to believe that at individual level, perhaps Germany is more easy to, is easier to convince to give you money than even borrow. <laughs> they would have done that, but since no one did that, I because, don't believe yeah, German journalists. You know, they said Germany gave money really nearly. And we, yeah. Germany was, like you said, he was the one who once said, the people should not buy newspapers so that journalists can starve to death because they are the illegitimate sons of Africa. Mr. Kande, so coming back to the whole situation again, was that the right platform, even if this thing had happened? Was that the right platform for President, Jam, uh, President Barrow to say that some journalists came to me and requested money? It's, it's interesting, Omar. I mean, um, you know, if you look at President Barrow's statement and in the context in which he made the statement, you wonder what did he want to achieve, you know? And as president, and like Sipu rightly mentioned, um, you know, you should be measured in terms of what you're saying. You should weigh the pros and cons of, if I make this statement, what are the consequences? What do I want to achieve? And so if you look at that, look at this statement in that context, the question that we, we all ask is, what did the president want to achieve with this kind of statement? And ultimately, and from, if you look at, we can't tell what was in his mind because we, we are not, we, we, I mean, he is the only one who knows what was going on in his mind, but if you look at the effects of his statement, uh, like we've not and they was agreed uh, with me that it has the potential to, to, to undermine the, the, the public trust in the media to perform its fundamental role. And so as president, I think he should have thought twice before he, you know, he uttered such a statement. I think in addition to that, what is also important, and I think that is largely lacking, not just in the game, but you know, across the continent and across the world, is, is media literacy. This difference between uh, business component of news media organizations and the news department. And this has always been like an academic debate in, in academia that there should be a you know, clear court separation between the business component of news media and news departments of news, uh, news organizations. Uh, and this is a debate that continues. But what is fundamentally important is that we all agree that as far as news is concerned, I mean, there should be not there should there should not be any sort of favoritism or you know or payment or paying of money or accepting of donations or gifts in order to achieve favorable coverage, and that's what the president is alleging. But unfortunately, and I want to agree with Seiko on this, that probably there's a PR organization or a marketing unit of a journalism house or a news organization that approached the president and said, look. We think you did probably a good job, and we think we can help you, you know, polish your image here and there. And we see that happening all over the world. A PR organization, you know, marketing departments of established news organizations, the BBC, the CNN, and all whatnot, they do special reports. You know, however, it's clearly indicated in these reports that this is paid for content. And, and as a result, it does not sort of confuse the public as to whether or not this is regular news or otherwise. And I think that's important, yeah. So Seiko, as far as you know, are you privy to any information that, or any news outlet or journalist that approach Barrow for such kind of things, for doing PR, and he might confuse it with bribery or so? Well, um, to be quite honest with you, no. I'm not privy to any such information. Of course, I saw your post where you were saying um, someone told you that New African Magazine actually approach the federal government to do that kind of job for them. But New African does that, I mean, almost everywhere in the world. I mean, and sometimes they come under attack for it. Remember, before, just a month before the Tunisian uprising, they went there and they did a fantastic report about Tunisia and its economy and very good, nice things they said about Ben Ali. And one month later, I mean, there was an uprising there. And people are saying, oh, you went there and then you did all these things. But they did it for even Mugabe. Yeah. You understand? But then, if I were a president, for example, I wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to get some PR job. I mean, it's part of your work. People should see the work that you do, and if PR people want to come and do that for me, why not? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will give it to them. For the purpose of, purpose of clarity, a new African magazine is a pan-African magazine that publishes on monthly basis and is 
circulate and I can say worldwide. And uh, like you're talking about that issue, uh, the editor, like there are two fantastic journalists, Bafo Komo and Joseph Warungu, and Bafo has been somebody many describe as a, as a, as a Pan-African because he regularly interview President Mugabe. If uh, what we are saying that is the whole thing, was that unethical for, and like we would discuss for new African to tell, or um, I, I think we're having a problem with the, with the microphone here. They said the low mic, uh, yeah, the sound is, I don't know where, the, yeah, sound, okay. So was it ethical or unethical? That's, that's an interesting question. I, I think well, basically appointing the president mm -hmm. for PR work is not unethical. Yeah. And uh, what would be unethical is to appoint the president for PR work and present that as you know, standard or regular news. You know, that is unethical to the extent that it's deceptive and you're not transparent with your viewers or with your audience. Uh, so that would be unethical and therefore very much below the standards of you know, good journalism or quality journalism. However, like we've all noted, I mean, New African Magazine does this, and in most of their editions, they clearly indicate that this is paid for content. These are sponsored um, you know, articles and write-ups and so on and so forth. Uh, so to that extent, it's, I don't see that as unethical uh, as far as I'm concerned, because journalism is also a business. People need to make money, you know, need to pay your bills and all that. No, it's, it's expensive. Somebody has to pay the news. The economists will tell you there's no free lunch. Uh, even in the media, there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch in the media. And, uh, so this thing has just there are so many this statement i can say has angered many journalists in this country so what is the gambia press union doing as far as this allegation is concerned well we allow the debate to uh, to unravel and to continue i mean these are things that when they happen you don't necessarily need to come and make a position on it i mean we are living in a democratic state um, people should say as they deem fit. Um, I love it when I see journalists coming out and say, "Mr. President, you need to clarify this." It's not just a matter of a, a matter for the GPU, but everyone as well. I'm not sure this is something that the GPU should essentially take a position on. But mm -hmm. I would perhaps take this opportunity to tell the president to be more specific. Please tell us who these journalists are, because without doing that. He is potentially putting into disrepute mm -hmm. the credibility of this very noble profession. The credibility of the journal, noble profession. And because when Barrow made this statement, he said journalist. So um, we have been doing our investigation. And as far as we know, as far as we know, let's make, let me make this thing categorically clear. No Gambian journalist approached Barrow for money in exchange for writing good stories about him. Mr. Kandek, um, Continuing with the conversation, President Barrow just made a blank allegation. Like Seku said, what do you think this the impact it will have on the Gambian media? That's a very, very serious um, question. If you look at uh, the, the, the impact, it's one of two things. I mean, the extreme version of it would be um, you know, where people will sort of you know, discern journalists, they will you know, point at journalists and, you know, all one. And in some cases, we, we can say it could lead to some sort of violence. And unfortunately, we've seen at the beginning of, of you know, the opening of press freedom and freedom of expression and sort of the so-called new democracy that we have in the Gambia, some, you know, party militants of some, you know, political parties actually, you know, taking the law into their own hands and, you know, scolding journalists, physically yeah. attacking them. And so if, if, you know, it can degenerate to that level, you can argue that the president's opinion or the president's uh, comments, you know, carry a lot of weight, you know, and uh, uh, to that extent, it could fuel some sort of, you know, you know, uh, tension against Gambian journalists, could fuel some sort of, you know, anger and hate against uh, media professionals. Um, and like Seku said, if he's not specific as to who is saying this, the anger could be, you know, uh, overly generated and, you know, put against all journalists in this country. And that would undermine our efforts in terms of performing our fundamental constitutional right of holding public officials to account. Uh, that will undermine you know, the basic building blocks of democracy, freedom of expression and the media. And that will not, it's not healthy essentially for our burden democracy. It's small, it's, it's an imagined democracy. After 22 years, most of the institutions and the, the basics that we've built 
since independence have been almost destroyed completely. So we are just emerging, you know, two years into into this new era, and so it's probably too early for President Barrow, you know, to, to go that way. It's it's rather unfortunate. Um, I think we should do much more in terms of you know, enhancing the good work of journalists and you know strengthening the basic institutions that we have started in building a democratic, prosperous and developed country. Like I ask, and I will ask you the same thing. Even if this thing had happened, what do you think should be the best way President Barrow should address the issue? Well, there are institutions here. The President could have addressed this to the Minister of Information and the Minister of Information could have addressed it to the GPU or any relevant institution that could call the journalists concerned and caution them if they are, what they've done is not in line with the ethics of the profession. I mean, I think that's the best way to do. But if the president feels that he still, you know, is uh, still he still has the right to go ahead and say it, then he should be even more courageous to be specific and tell us who did it. I mean, but it's not, I, like if I say the ministers, I mean, took money like that. Yeah. So that's a, but Baron yeah. wouldn't like that. He yeah. wanted me to say who. You know, so because that's, that's like putting, yes. just, you just said ministers. Yes, ministers. So it's like, uh, it yeah. includes everybody. So it has to be a specific yeah. minister, X or Y or? Oh, oh yes. Oh yes. It has to be. You know, it has to be. Well, viewers, um, I am Omar, and I have Adem Makande. He's a, a lecturer at the University of the Gambia School of Journalism and Digital Media, and uh, Seku Jame. He's a journalist. He works for Radio France International, The Guardian, and he's also the Secretary General of the Gambia Press Union. We are discussing about the claims made by President Barrow recently. He said some journalists uh, approached him and requested money for them to do stories, having, and write stories that are not even true according to what was published on the on the standard newspaper. So we will take a very short commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue with the discussion. Tough Africa Global is pleased to launch Dalaba Housing Estate. Dalaba Housing Estate is our newest estate located on the Sukuta Jabang Road. You can buy a finished two or three bedroom house or service plots accompanied with a free fence and gate. At Dalaba Housing Estate, you get to enjoy bituminized roads, gated and fenced properties, solar street lights, water reticulation, public amenities, 1,500 fruit trees aligned in streets and many more. Make a 40% down payment today and spread the balance conveniently for 10 years with GD Bank, Echo Bank and Trust Bank. Terms and conditions apply. Wait, this is the best part. We are giving a discount on outright payments. For more information and exceptional service, please call our office line on plus 220-4410233. Better still, Call us on mobile or via WhatsApp on plus 220-376-2333 or plus 220-776-2333. You can also visit our website on www.tafafricahomes.com. Taf Africa Global. Our experience is global. Our focus is Africa. Welcome back after that short commercial break. I'm here with... Um, Two, I can say, journalists. Uh, the one is, other one on my right side, the Makane lectures at the University of the Gambia School of Journalism and Digital Media. And the left side is Seku Jami, he's a correspondent for RFI and uh, the Guardian newspaper. He's also the Secretary General of the Gambia Press Union. So, Seku, uh, is this another, can put it, quote unquote, attack on the media? Because when you talk about attack on the media, it doesn't only mean arresting journalists closing down media houses or burning down like it happened on the Jamais regime? Well, we, what we have seen is quite a disturbing trend from the president and his government. And in the papers that you reviewed today, you also said that we is saying something not so nice about social media. media. Exactly. I mean, we, this is a government that, uh, when they were not there, benefited greatly from the media and from um, social media. And they never hesitated to recognize that when they came to power. And the first few months or many months of it, we've seen or had the president say media personnel uh, or the media you know, partners in development, I love them. And that is so important to us because for the past 22 years, what we've been having is that President Yama used to say that you people represent 0.001% yeah, yeah. and that you are enemies of, this, of, yeah. of, the, of the people. Mm -hmm. And for a journalist, you can't even have a decent conversation with a Gambian. 
Yeah. Once you introduce yourself as a journalist, they will say, oh, no, no, let me move away from you. Now with Baru in and his remarks, we've started perception changing a bit. We can now sit more comfortably with people that we claim to represent. So with remarks like this, I mean, it, 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 it risks taking us back, I mean, to those days where our relationship with the public, which we are representing, will be, I mean, mad by, you know, uh, distrust. Well, in reference to what he said, in 2011 presidential election, when Jamek cast his vote and he was asked, and he said he will not allow journalists to destroy this country because they are less than, he will not allow journalists to destroy this country because they are less than 1% of this country and his own, I will not allow one, people, people who are less than 1% of this country to destroy 99% of this country. What, is, what are your thoughts of this uh, remark, again, on, on the impact or the effect on journalists? Yeah, it's, uh, it's undermining journalists' ability to uh, perform their, their responsibilities and perform their duties. And it lowers their character, their demeanor, and as such, uh, that will uh, affect their ability to uh, function in a democracy. And I mean, I think another important component to this is that, you know, a lot of people might argue, and rightly, that President Adama Barrow has his right to his opinion. And obviously, he is. And he can hold opinions, you know, good or bad, negative or positive, of the media, and so on and so forth, which is quite okay. Well, fundamentally, what is important is that when you're holding opinions, this opinion must be grounded, yes, sir. and they must not be opinions that are there to undermine, you know, good governance structures, you know, fundamental institutions in a democracy. I have no problem with President Adamabro coming out, uh, you know, openly and criticizing, say, for instance, poor coverage yeah. of the media, or saying, oh, the media is only following workshop size, which, I mean, personally, I've, uh, we've criticized the media for that. But going, you know, way out to sort of overgeneralize, you know, a statement like that, it's, it's actually and quite honestly an attack on the press, an attack on, on the media, and actually an attack on our, you know, emerging democracy. Because at the end of the day, if you, you know, destabilize the, the, the media, if you disable the media, then you're sort of, you know, crippling our, our, our emerging democracy, and it doesn't help. For people, it doesn't help for us as a small country and as an emerging country from you know 22 years of victims. We saw the you know the rhetoric of Jame and his opponents in, in back in the days. Um, his, his attacks on the press were not just you know physical and so on; they were also verbal. And, yeah. and I think uh, that's how it began. And unfortunately, whereas we don't expect this to you know you know spiral into physical attacks um, in in the context of what's happening right now in the Gambia. But it has the potential, you know, to, to, to get to that level. And you know, it's it's important that we talk about this. It's important that uh, we find a resolution to some of these issues and to definitely put a stop to this. Um, like a comment on the issue or the comment by by the, by the vice president himself on on, on social media uh, about social media is is again very very worrying. You know, uh, these are very people who a few years ago would you know. Praise journalism, praise activists, you know, and so on and so forth. I mean, these platforms, the media, and so on and so forth, they come along with some sort of challenges as well. I mean, it's quite important that we, as, as a people and as uh, as a country, are aware of some of these challenges. But just because you don't agree with someone, you should not castigate them. Unfortunately, I, I want to put the the statement of President Adam Abbott in, in a more global context, and you see that this is becoming an emerging global trend. We've seen President Trump in the U.S. Exactly. Uh, essentially, you know, going all out to attack people that he disagrees with, you know, essentially, you know, branding the press as enemy of the people. It's that unfortunate, you know, and we don't want President Obama to take cues from, you know, uh, sort of a body dictator like President Trump of the United States. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really not uh, what we would want to see in this country. So, Seku, is the, is, are we going to continue with the debate on the social media or there should be more, these things will be taken more seriously because the debate is already on and um, should, what do you think the journalists should do now? Well, I think the debate should be taken more seriously and then I am very happy that you have been quite proactive in bringing together this platform. Um, and when we are talking about it, we shouldn't talk only in the context of what Barrow said. Mm -hmm. But as a unionist, I will also take it further to even challenge the president to tell him that nearly two years on, since he has taken power, he hasn't done anything that could potentially um, improve the economic conditions of the journalist. Um, you know, for him to say, say remarks like that. 
the tax regime that was here being used by JAME to suppress the press are still here. The laws that were here to suppress the press fundamentally are still here. I mean, so uh, we would want the president to be seen to be doing things that will improve journalism in the country and not necessarily doing things that will undermine journalism and, you know, yeah. There is always con confusion here. What citizen exercising their views on social media, some people take them as journalists and those, they, they, they categorize everybody, even those working in the mainstream media. So what can you enlighten us on this issue? Well, um, you know, imagine of social networking sites, Facebook, Twitter, you know, WhatsApp, you know, Snapchat, and so on and so forth, has given, you know, enormous power to the general public. Um, however, that's not to be confused with, you know, mainstream media houses. And still today, uh, TV is regarded as one of the most powerful media houses. On the other hand, newspapers remain one of the most trusted you know, media uh, institutions or news organizations. So still mainstream media is very, very essential. Notwithstanding, the, the emergence of technology or the, the emergence of these social networking platforms and applications have empowered ordinary people you know, to the level that they can be part of the process of journalism, information sharing, and participate in the governance structure. And as such, in some contexts, they are considered journalists, others consider them, you know, citizen journalists, and so on and so forth. Um, notwithstanding, in the strict definition of a journalist, they don't qualify as, you know, journalists with, you know, professional code of ethics and standards that they follow. Uh, on the other hand, journalists in mainstream media have strict, you know, code of ethics that they must abide by and failure to do which they will, you know, risk public reprisal and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. You know, this is just the public. Think of social media or Facebook, Twitter and others as the bantabas of of the past. You know, we can all go to the bantabas and all what we do at the bantabas is here say, narrating mm -hmm. events and so on and so forth. And sometimes even backbiting and slandering others. The only difference today is that once you do that on social media, you're doing it at a global scale or you're talking to a global audience and so on and so forth. But it's it's been here with us for long. And and, and so in terms of you know, issues in, in terms of governing this, in terms of responding to issues of what should be said and what should not be said, you know, utmost care must be taken in terms of regulating this. It's fundamentally important that we don't lose sight of the fact that um, it's, it, these are new technologies and they're actually evolving still. We don't even know what's going to happen in the next five, ten years as far as these platforms are concerned. So quite often we hear people like, they always said, Facebook journalists. If somebody somewhere just put something, just information, they always say it's a Facebook journalist. What can you tell us about this? Whether is that, are they Facebook journalists or what are these people? <laughs> well, there is no better way to describe them. I mean, <laughs> essentially you call them, like they must say, citizen journalists. Exactly. Mean, but then um, you have a lot of, I mean, people operating online on different platforms, Facebook, Twitter and I mean many other platforms sharing information. I think essentially the difference that we have with them is, you know, like someone said, verify, verify, verify. I mean, they just gather and then put it out there. As journalists, when we gather, we process because we have the training and the intelligence to process it and verify our information before we um, finally put it out. So, but for Facebook and all other mm -hmm. platforms, you can't control them. They are, by definition, I mean, they are to be, you know, free so that, like, they must share it, like a marketplace of ideas where anyone can come and just dump whatever you have there. But then, they, we should look at the benefits that they have than the, you know, otherwise things. Because, one, they enhance democracy. Trust me, everyone or anywhere in this part of the world can feel that his voice is heard through I mean, those platforms, even those in hard to reach places where the mainstream journalists wouldn't go. Any topic is, is within limits. No topic is off limits as, 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 as far as Facebook and all these social media platforms are concerned. And it's also fun. Every day I love to go out and see what Pata wrote or maybe what someone else wrote. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it makes life very good, you know. So essentially, they're really very good. Well, um... In, uh, to add to that, um, so, like some journalists will, actually, good, let me cite one person from BBC, even Africa Service, Akwasi Sapong. You look at his Twitter, Twitter handle, he will sell you comments here, 
are entirely mine. They are not from are not for BBC. So that's what people should uh, differentiate here. So do you have a similar thing? You I know you worked for D Double some times ago. When you are tweeting, do you have also that kind of a caveat on your Twitter handle? Well, um, I argue that what I tweet and what I share on my Facebook and all of all other uh, social network platforms that I use is entirely my view and my opinion. And uh, sometimes I share what I like, and sharing something doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with that or that I, I, I like that. Sometimes I share things just to provoke a discussion or to provoke uh, a conversation. And, and as such, it should be you know, treated as such. And, and, and we see a lot of journalists, and I, I have done, uh, I, don't, I did my thesis on how um, government officials, particularly international organizations, use social networks to engage young people in terms of governance issues. And what is common between, especially I looked at the European Union and the African Union, is that most of the cases, you know, whatever they say on social network, they try to make sure that it's what the position of the of the organization that they stand for uh, um, is it, it takes in terms of public issues or issues of public concern. Journalists, on the other hand, they try to uh, distinguish them between what they say as news and what is uh, uh, opinionated, and and that's that's fundamentally important in terms of understanding the conversation on public issues at various levels. And and I think. Therefore, and I've always said this, that there's need for some level of you know media literacy programs. A lot of people don't really seem to understand you know the work of journalists, responsibility of journalists, the different components of journalism, and so on and so forth. And as such, sort of confuse uh, what it is mean to be a journalist and what the function or fundamental duties of a journalist are. And and, and as such, we've seen in, in most cases that we see journalists are branded as politicians, journalists are branded as enemies of progress, and so on and so forth. This, for me, uh, call for a more sort of understanding uh, of the natural role, or the, you know, sort of in our context, the constitutional role of journalists, especially uh, public or state broadcasters. Well, somebody is saying that the Gambia Press, you know, sort of set standard. Well, yeah. we discussed this last time. Yeah. There are standards in the Gambia media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the schools are there. University, the GPU school, and even private, like mm -hmm. inside, they are there training people, giving them values that they need to be able to practice. I mean, in, in journalism in the Gambia, we do have a very strong culture of mentorship. People go through, um, you know, extensive apprenticeship before they emerge. I mean, as as, as writers, I mean, GPU has a code of conduct. I mean, which is very good. I have seen code of conduct from you know other countries, but the GPU one, it's the only one across Africa where you have a three-in-one code. Not only in terms of general ethics, but also as they apply to children, as they apply on gender-based violence. So those code of conduct, and that code of conduct is there, and we're trying to come up with a media council, a body that will be there to monitor and enforce I mean, um, the principles that we agreed in the code. But the standards are there, man. <laughs> I told you the standards are there. You know? Okay. Um, Mr. Kane, it's been a long, long uh, interview. So finally, what, what would be your final message? Uh, my, my message would be that as a journalist, uh, we, like uh, Sik pointed out, we have this fundamental or we have very useful codes of ethics that we all adhere to. And I think as a journalist and a journalism trainer, I would encourage all journalists in this country and beyond to continue to uphold these you know, high principles, values, or standards of ethics of journalism. Um, I also want to point this clearly that as journalists, I mean, uh, our fundamental responsibility is to the Gambian public, or to the public essentially. And so in so doing, you know, irrespective of our relationship with politicians, irrespective of our relationship with sources, we should you know, keep in mind that Yes, our responsibility is to the Cambian public, or to the public, or to the audience whom we serve, locally and internationally. And as such, um, you know, uh, all our dealings, you know, whether in public or in private, should be uh, influenced by, by those standards and principles. Seko? Well, if there is any journalist out there mm -hmm. that, under any circumstance, did uh, uh, make an overture to the president mm -hmm. to do some PR or anything, please, I will urge you to come out and clarify yourself and tell us why you did what you did. I mean, 
and the, at the same time also, I will please urge the president to come out more specifically and say who ask money from him. And more importantly, I will implore in him as the president to be the foremost, the foremost defender of press freedom at all times. Thank, Thank you very much, Demakande, uh, professor, a lecturer at the University of the Gambia School of Journalism and Digital Media and Sekou Jame, correspondent for RFI and the Guardian newspaper. He's also the Secretary General of the Gambia Press Union. That's all we have for you today. I am Omar Wali, and from me and my team, I'm saying thank you so much. Hey, what are you doing here? I'm going to replace my Africel 3G SIM card. Why use a 3G SIM card when you have a 4G phone? Replace your 3G SIM card today for the real Africel 4G SIM and receive one gigabyte of internet data for free. Really? Yes, get one gigabyte for free just by replacing your SIM card at any Aficel outlet. With no loss of contact, the cost of bundle from the 3G SIM card is the same for the 4G SIM. And guess what? With the 4G SIM card, you can also connect to the 3G network as well. This is so cool. I'll replace my 3G SIM card right away to the real 4G SIM and receive my very own one gigabyte for free. From AfriCell, it's always real and it's for free. Where AfriCell goes, oh, oh, no one has the speed to follow.